So this question came in from Tom, and uh, Tom actually has a um, he's one of our partners, and he has a, a blog, a trading blog online. Um, and this question here was part of um, uh, a crack spread system. So just so you're aware, you know, Raven is not capable of doing crack spreads. So that would require a highly specialized strategy in order to trade a crack spread. Right? Typically, um, a ninja trader strategy is only designed to trade, you know, just the one instrument that this, you know, whatever chart you put a strategy on, um, you know, so this is the NQ chart. So strategies in NinjaTrader are designed to only trade the instrument of the chart that the strategy is on. So that would be the NQ, right? So if we were trading, actually, I'll switch this over to oil. Um, so if we were trading a crack spread, right, that requires you to trade two or three instruments at one time. And um, that's not, that's, um, it's not the default behavior of a strategy. Uh, you know, you could write a custom strategy to do that. Um, but like I said, you know, that, that would have, you'd have to have some custom handling um, to, uh, of the strategy you know, to be able to tell the strategy what other instruments um, should be traded, you know, to create the crack spread. So, um, you know, the thought was that, well, maybe you could put two Ravens, you know, on two different charts um, and have them sync up. But actually, that's not possible. NinjaTrader doesn't provide a way to sync up strategies between two different charts. So essentially, a strategy kind of runs in its own um, environment. And so, uh, a, you know, so if you put, so for example, if I put Raven on, on this chart here, Raven's only aware of itself. It wouldn't be aware of Raven running on any other strategy. Um, you know, and Raven would not be aware of any other trades that may, that you may have opened manually using the DOM, right? So a strategy runs in its own separate little bubble environment and it's isolated from everything else All right so 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 because of that um, you know you wouldn't be able to use uh, Raven to, to issue a crack spread so but what I can do is um, I can show you know these uh, the setup uh, you know for this system here um, and it's uh, it's going to be, a, I guess, a good little lesson because it's going to show you how to synchronize um, two different requirements, right? So one requirement is we need the the RSI uh, to be below 25 or above the 75, right? So the RSI is the green line on my chart here, All right? So we're we're waiting for the RSI to be in the oversold or overbought situation for at least three bars and then and then at the same time we're waiting for um, a price to cross over one of the Keltner channels uh, channels so right, we got two conditions and they don't always synchronize up exactly right so um, this will kind of be a, uh, a lesson in you know how it, how to get two different indicators to synchronize with each other so um, all right uh, so just a sec here before I get go any further um, let me look through the comments here and see if there's anything quickly I can address all right see Phillips is saying uh, he's seen some weird behavior loading tick data is this related uh, no it would not be all right, I hope I get this person's name right. I'm probably going to slaughter, slaughter it, but I think, I think it's pronounced uh, Kaylee Boa. Um, I hope I got that close enough for you to understand. Um, so I guess you're new to uh, these Friday workshops. So uh, for the most part, these are open Friday workshops, so you can ask uh, any question you want. 
So if you are working on something, that's kind of what these are for. You can um, ask your question, you know, in the room, or if if it's a kind of a requires a lot of detail, then you can email your question in to us. Um, I just ask that you. So everybody, if you want to email your questions in ahead of time, right? So here's our email address. Um, it's right support at sharkindicators.com. You know, please email your questions in by you know Thursday morning. Um, you know, if you email them in today, it's just not going to give me enough time to to look at them or to see them. So I ask that you email your questions in for these Friday workshops. You know, by by Thursday morning. Uh, so it gives me plenty of time to take a look at them. And also uh, another major reason why I need them by Thursday is because. A lot of times I have to reply back and get more information because a lot of times people don't provide all the information I need uh, in order to, to address the question properly. Um, so that way if you email it Thursday, at least it gives me time to email you back and you to email me the missing information. So, um, uh, so um, yeah, so anybody please feel free to ask your questions, um, you know, regarding building a system. and. That's what these workshops are for. It's just to show you how to build it live. Um, and then also at the end of the workshop, um, right, we'll be left with the Bloodhound template. And you can email us and ask us for for the uh, the Bloodhound template that I build in these Friday workshops as well. All right, so um, back to Tom's question. So we're, we're using two different indicators here. Um, all right, we're waiting for the RSI to go into uh, a, uh, an oversold situation, right? So we want it to be less than 25 in the oversold situation, and this is for a long entry. Um, and we want at least three bars in the oversold area. Uh, and then um, we're also waiting for the Keltner channel, well, actually we're waiting for the low price of the bar um, to cross cross above our upper Keltner channel. All right, so, um, so we want the RSI in the oversold area for at least three bars. And, oops, actually, um, let me... I was just playing around before the workshop, so I'm going to... Clear everything out and start from scratch. There we go. So let me start from scratch. Okay, good. So we're looking for um, the RSI to be in this oversold situation. Um, and then we're also looking for price to the low of the bar to break above. So let's see. Yeah, it looks like we might have gotten a low to break above right there, um, but over here where the RSI is oversold, the, the low is definitely didn't break above um, the channel. It broke below the lower channel, so we'll have to look through the chart and find out where where we might find you know one of these conditions. Um, all right, so um, you know I already have the. RSI set up and the Keltner set up on my chart and we have Bloodhound on the chart already. So let's get started here. Right. So the first thing we should do is um, assign a name to our Bloodhound file. So I'm going to hit the change button and that change button essentially just brings the save up or I'm sorry the save as dialog box and I'll just use a oops, I'll use a previous file name, and there we go. So there was the last workshop, and let's see, today is the fifth already. Man, I hope you guys are finished with your Christmas shopping because it's coming up quick. All right, so December fifth, there we go. Um, and I think I'll just start working on the logic board today. All right.
right, so I'll start a new logic board and um, let's see, uh, I'll call this uh, RSI and uh, Keltner, uh, Keltner channel. Um, oh, I guess crossover. All right, so um, first thing I well, first thing I'll look at is I'll look at the um, the RSI, and we're going to be using a, a threshold solver for this because we're looking for the RSI to cross below the 25 threshold or cross above the 75 threshold, right? And so what makes these threshold levels is because the RSI is bound to a fixed range, right? The RSI only oscillates between 0 and 100. So it has a defined range. So any any indicator that, that runs in its own subpanel, you know, ha pretty much has a defined range. Um, you know the MACDs and this and um, yeah the MACD is kind of one that while it's in a sub panel it doesn't really have a defined maximum and minimum range but you know you can see that for the most part you know price would have to really move extremely to really kind of get the MACD to move to uh, you know a really huge range so even the MACD kind of has a defined range, you know, depending on the volatility of, the, of your instrument that you have the MACD on. Um, and the same with the CCI. The CCI doesn't have a defined range, um, but it requires a lot of volatility for the CCI to really kind of move out, out into extreme ranges. So, you know, so from that standpoint, I'd say that, you know, even the MACD and the CCI still kind of have a defined range. You know, the CCI typically... Um, doesn't go out of the doesn't go above 200 or below less than 200 but but they do have you know ranges you know the MACD has a range that we can count on you know so the MACD floats above zero or below zero and the CCI the same right and the CCI uh, will move slightly above zero or below zero you know so those kind of have um, you know what you can consider threshold ranges whereas indicators on that run on price um, because price can move so so wildly um, you know I mean this is oil oil was up in the 110s you know not too long ago and now it's down to 66 so it's really um, doesn't make much sense to use the threshold on an indicator that that runs in the price panel I mean you can um, you definitely can use the threshold solver to say you know hey as a simple example, you know, tell me when, you know, when oil, you know, breaks $65. You could use the threshold solver to tell you when, you know, the, the actual price of oil breaks $65. You know, maybe that's a, uh, a major, you know, support line for oil that you've determined and you want to know if oil breaks that. Um, so you could, you know, you can use the threshold solver um, on price, um, but typically that's not, uh, typically I guess that's not very common. Um, all right. All right. So let's go grab a threshold solver. And there we go. And I'm going to connect this into the result node as we're working on this. And I'll name the solver. And we'll switch the indicator over. So let's go select the RSI. And um, let's see, let me look on the chart here. I forgot the settings we were using. So the RSI is a five period. All right. So. We'll keep the smooth the same, but we'll change the period to the 5. And we're using the RSI, not the average. So, All right, so next we need to enter our threshold levels. And uh, keep in mind that the threshold levels have to be in descending order, right? So um, the first threshold level is 75. That's the highest uh, 
the greatest threshold level, so 75. And the lowest threshold level is 25. So we're going to put 25 in there. Um, now these have to be in descending order, so you can't leave zeros in here. You need to put some kind of value that's in between 75 and 25. So I will just choose um, 50, like so. So all of my threshold levels are in descending order, like so. Um, and there's a reason why I didn't leave E as, at zero. You'll notice I didn't leave that at zero, right? I could have left that at zero and then put 25 up here or something like that. But there's a reason for it, and that's because of how the outputs work. So you'll notice um, that the sh short output and the long output, it says less than zero, right? So since we're looking for the indicator to go into an oversold situation, we're looking for it to be less than 25, um, right? So I need to E to actually be 25. So that way you can see the description says less than 25 because that's what we're looking for. We're looking for less than 25 or greater than 75. So that's why I put 75 up top and 25 down below is to match up with the, the output settings. So, all right, so we'll put 50 in there. All right, so the trade rules say that, or the conditions say that we're looking for um, a long output when RSI goes into the oversold situation. So in other words, we want a long output when the, when the RSI is less than 25. So we're going to put a 1 in there to get an output. And there we go. So we can see as soon as, um, all right, whenever the indicator is below 25, we're getting uh, an output. And we can see right now we kind of have this analog type of output, right? So we can see as the indicator starts, as it rises and moves away from 25, we can see the the output of that one solver um, you know, gets closer to zero, actually diminishes. Um, and then we can see when the RSA dips back down towards 25, we can see the output actually rises again. Um, now, that's using the fuzzy logic of Bloodhound. However, the, these rules are pretty, uh, um, pretty absolute. Um, you know, absolute defined value levels that are required. So what we're going to do is we're going to eliminate this fuzzy logic um, type of output. And what I can do is I can change my threshold D to be 25. So you can see I have two values of 25 here now and now when we look at the chart we can see we only get an output from that solver only when the indicator is below 25 so if it's ever above 25 by any amount right there's no output so it kind of you know creates a, an easy clear visual um, to see there all right, and so when the RSI is above 75, we want a short output, so let's put a 1 in there. And let's see, yeah, here we go. So there we go. There's a couple of um, places where the RSI is above 75. And once again, we can see it has this analog type of output. So what we can do is go back to our threshold levels and we can put 75 in there in B. And now we can see it cleaned up the short, the short output to a nice digital, uh, clean digital type look. Right? So I put the threshold level that we're looking for, 75, I put that in there twice. And I put 25 in there twice. And in the C, I just put 50 in the middle because you have to have something in there. Um, so. In this particular case, it doesn't matter if it's 50 or not. You know, I could put anything between 25 and 75 would work just fine. Um, but so, all right. So there's the first part, right? We're we we are, we're able to find whenever the CCI is oversold or overbought. So the next requirement, remember, is we needed three bars. We needed um, 
we need um, uh, so we need to know the latest three bars of the indicator of the RSI um, being oversold or overbought. So the way we can accomplish that, and we can use the look back. So we'll use this look back. Let's connect this in here, like so. And we don't want a displacement. So what a displacement does is it shifts is it shifts the signals. So if we look here, so here this is obvious. You can see right here, um, this point, this bar is actually below 25, but we can see the signal actually occurred one bar later. Uh, and that's because of this, the displacement. So if we set this to zero, there we go. Now we can see everything lines back up normally. And now we're looking for three bars in a row to be below 25. So we're going to set the look back to three. And we're going to change our average to look for the minimum. Actually, we're going to look for the minimum. So there we go. So we can see we got uh, we have one bar below 25. Let's see, yeah, one bar below 25, and a second bar below 25, and then the third bar, we actually get uh, an output now on the third bar. So if we scroll back, yeah, here we go. So we got bar one, and then bar two, and then on the third bar below, we get an output. And we can see up here, um, the R size is above 75, but we only got two bars where it was above 75. All right, so um, let's see here. Let me, I'm going to take a moment and show you guys a little trick that's helpful to see this stuff. Um, so if you really like that line look, to, uh, sometimes these lines make it kind of difficult to see where the actual value is. So what we can do is I'll add the RSI on there twice, match up the periods, and let's see, I'll change, you know, I'll, I'm going to change the plot style um, to a, uh, let's see, a dot, there we go, to a dot. Uh, let's see, a three dots should be fine, and I'll make sure it's on the same panel, so that's panel two. Hit apply. And, oh, what, oh, my scale just, let's you know, it's right, um, oh, the period's wrong, it's a five period, the Keltner was a 20 period, there we go, and, oh, 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 I see, <laughs> actually made a mistake on the first RSI, so that should be a five period. This other RSI is a five period. There we go. Okay. There we go. So now you can see dots, which tells you where the actual value is on top of the line plot. So that makes it a little easier to see exactly where the RSI value is. So we can see that there's only two dots above 75, so there's no no long condition there. Right. All right. Um, so the next step is we want to find when price uh, breaks below the band or above the band. So let's get blood and open back up. And let me find a place on the chart where that happens. All right, I think, yeah, that happens right over here. Um, now, there's, there's two ways we can do this. We could use the comparison solver and compare the price of the bar to the channel. Um, however, I think this 
kind of um, require would would it would be preferred to have one distinct kind of signal bar, you know, as opposed to you know having we can see we have three bars in a row, right? So we you know so um, yeah, I think it would, I think it would be better. Uh, I think it's preferred to have just one bar um, identify when both the RSI and the price broke out of the Keltner channel versus having you know multiple bars showing that that situation. I think that's what would be, be preferred. So I will use the crossover um, instead of the comparison. So the crossover is just going to give us a, an output, right, a signal on one bar the bar of the crossover, whereas the comparison gives us a signal or an output every time on every bar that the condition is met, right? So if we use the comparison, it would actually give us an output whenever the low is below the, the lower channel. But we just want to know when the low crosses the channel for just one signal on one bar. All right, so let's n name this. So we're looking for the high or the low um, to cross the uh, Keltner. All right, so indicator A is going to be our high and low price uh, values in here. So we're going to change that SMI to chameleon. So there's chameleon and um, all right so when when the low so the rules say if we go back to the rules um, it says so so for the long entry situation if the low crosses above the Keltner um, the Keltner actually says low line. Um, okay, yep, yeah, the low line. So if the low crosses um, crosses above the low line, so we're actually looking. Oh, yeah, so we're looking for the low, and we're going to look for a long signal using the low price and the high price. We're going to be using the high price to look for a short signal. So, so I guess to identify on the chart when, there we go, on that bar right there. So we can see the low of the bar breaks above um, the lower channel. Right like that. So. All right, so we have the the high and low prices set inside indicator A. So indicator B needs to be set to the Keltner channel. All right, so let's change the indicator settings. So we're looking for 2 and 20. All right, so we're using the lower channel to generate a long signal. Right, so when the low price break or crosses above the low channel, we want a long signal here, and we're using the upper channel to generate a short, uh, short signal. So, all uh, right, and there we go. So we can see, right here, right, the low price uh, crossed above the lower channel and gave us that long signal. And same thing here, we can see the low dipped below dipped below the low channel um, and then crossed back up into it. All right. Okay, so now um, the next step, so we have our two conditions and the next step is we want both of them to happen at the same time um, so we need to use an AND node. So let's plug an AND node in there. Connect that AND node up, and let's see if we get any results. And hey, look at that. We actually got one. Right on the chart. Um, 
So we can see we have um, the RSI below 25 for three bars, and the low price did dip down, um, dipped below the channel by one bar. All right, let's see if we can find some others. Um, all right, yeah, here we go. Let's take a look at this area here. So we can see RSI is definitely below or in the oversold for more than three bars. Um, and then um, the low price, let's see, where did, where did that, okay. It took price a little bit of time before it finally crossed uh, the lower channel. It took it a while. Um, so maybe this isn't a, a, a good, so maybe this isn't a good setup, but it just kind of shows you that it's definitely easy for the indicator and price to to be out of sync and you won't get a signal. Um, all right, so if we if we take a look, let's let's take a look at the RSI situation. Um, right, so that's pretty obvious right there. We got three bars right there. Um, I'll just there we go. Put the uh, put that circle right on it, like so. Those three bars are the RSI. Um, and then if we take a look at the Keltner channel condition, yeah, we can see right there where the green arrow is is where price crossed above that Keltner. And so we can see there's quite a number of bars in between. So, you know, maybe we don't want that actually as a, as a setup. But um, let's take a look through the chart and see if there's any other areas where where the two conditions are out of sync. And uh, so here's another situation. However, it did take price um, a while before it broke below the upper channel so yeah so we'll ignore that one and okay hey let's take a look let's take a look at this right here So let's see if we actually get a trade signal there. Oh, look, we didn't get a trade signal there. So let's um, let's kind of mark this. So we got one long output on the RSI right there on that bar, and let's take a look at the um, the Keltner channel condition and. So we got our crossover on this bar. So we can see that they're they're one bar off, right? So we didn't get a signal just because they're mismatched. They're mismatched by one bar. So what we may want to do is build in uh, an allowance um, for this to happen, right? So the the price crossing the channel may be delayed by one or two bars. Um, so we may want to, um, you know, build in an exception there uh, for that. So let's see how a way we can do that. Um, let's see. I think probably yeah. The simplest way is we'll just use a signal extender here. All right. So we can take right the the signals that we're getting from the RSI. And we can extend them forward into time, uh, you know, extend them forward a couple bars to give price a couple of extra bars to cross the channel. So let's connect that up there and connect that up. And let's take a look at the signal extender. Um, really, we're not going to use any reset functionality for this since it's such a simple situation we just want to extend the RSI uh, signals forward by a couple bars so I'm just going to turn off all of our reset conditions and I'm just going to make an arbitrary decision of just saying we'll allow two bars um, difference between the RSI condition and the Keltner channel condition right so 
we can see we now have um, two bars here uh, extending the RSI condition forward you know by an extra bar and if let's disconnect that so we'll take our signal extender plug it into there and now take a look at the result all right so now we actually got a trade signal there all right so you know if we want to allow you know maybe two bars after after the RSI you know crosses out of the oversold we can change this to three um, so that might that'll definitely provide a few more signals there um, and yep so look look at here so I can see that this was the last yeah this was the last bar for the RSI condition and then it moved out of the overbought um, but we can see that right our signal actually didn't uh, let's see hmm. Actually, it looks like we should be getting a signal one bar sooner let's let me take a look at that um, All right, now let's take a look at the crossover. And um, interesting. So the crossover, I can see. Oh, I'm sorry. We're looking at the high price. That's why. Yes. So the high price of the bar did cross over on this bar. <laughs> sorry, I was looking at the low price again, but the low price only applies when we're below the lower channel. So when we're above the upper channel we're looking at the high price of the bar right so if we yeah if we bring up the rules for a short uh, situation right we're using the the high price of the bar um, crossing right crossing the uh, the Keltner so let's see Tom actually said crosses above but I would speculate him means crosses below since that would be the opposite situation for his uh, long condition. So I actually interpreted this as being crossing below. Um, so. uh, all right, yeah, so actually that, that was correct there. I thought we had a one bar delay, but we don't. That's actually correct because the high price uh, did cross down on that bar so um, all right I believe that probably takes care of it um, you know if if in further testing you know if you find out that um, sometimes price will cross the Keltner before the RSI right crosses out of the you know oversold or overbought you know, so if you find out that price is moving first before the RSI indication indicator moves, then you know what you could do is also just add a signal extender in front of uh, this uh, crossover solver looking at the Keltner indicator, right? Um, so, and or also actually this is a crossover solver, so this actually has a look back built into it. So that's that's. Let's plug that in there. So we're looking at this crossover solver, right? So we can see we got one bar is being marked. If we use this look back, we could put two in there. All right, and so we get two bars now uh, marking the crossover. Um, if price crosses first before the RSI indicator, you know, does its thing, then you may want to, you know, use this look back period, so that way you extend the crossover condition forward, and and then wait for the RSI condition to happen second. But uh, that probably doesn't look like the case. You know, this RSI is 
is a five period, so this RSI moves very fast. So it's probably um, it's probably price is probably always the slower condition. Um, so we probably only need to to extend the signal there on uh, on the price. So all right, uh, that does it. John is asking, is there a webinar you've done that covers trailing a buy or sell limit based on the current bar close um, in order to get in on a pullback? And John also gave me some clarification. Now, let's see. Okay. So John is saying, let's say something like a, a three tick, uh, three ticks away from the close price. All right. So. Uh, let's see, let's, let's put Raven on a chart here. So to get to Raven, we're going to open up the strategy window. And we'll put Raven on the chart there. Um, let's see. Well, yeah, I guess I will load, how about if I, hmm, just, I'm trying to think of a good Bloodhound system that would apply to, to what you're trying to do, John. Maybe I'm putting too much thought into this. Um, hmm. Yeah, I'll just load up today's template since I already have it on the chart and we can see it and hopefully we'll get some good examples out of this all right so I loaded up bloodhound and uh, let me select the entry uh, template so this is the template that we actually want to trade that's going to execute the entry signals uh, we, we you can also build a separate logic template in bloodhound that actually um, signals the exit uh, that you know generates exit signals so you can use bloodhound signals to generate an entry and also to close out a position as well so that's what the exit logic is for and all right so John's interested in using a limit order here so we're gonna set this to true right which opens up additional parameters here and um, all right so this allow re-entry on the same bar this only applies when calculating on bar close is set to false uh, right so normally you're going to run raven with calculate on bar close set to true it just depends on on how on your trading style your trading conditions if if this is set to true or false there's no generic explanation of what that could be um, so I really can't give you any examples of when you would want this true or when you would want this false it really depends on the individual um, trading system so um, I guess I can say um, in, in knowing how you know, the intentional trader um, you know how Tony's system works from intentional trader his system actually waits for the bar to open because you need to know where that open price is before you jump into a trade um, so since he's using the opening price of the next bar um, Tony's uh, trading systems actually need to run with calculate on bar close set to false Right, so that's the only way that you can analyze the opening price of the next bar um, and jump in the trade right away is to have this set to false. So I guess that's one example I can give you, but there's definitely other reasons why you may need to have calculate on bar close set to false, but normally you're going to want to leave this on true. Um, so once again, you know, this, this here only applies um, to when calculate on bar close is set to false so we can ignore this for now because we're set leaving this on true um, okay so cancel after X bars 
So whenever you place a limit order out there in the market, right, you just don't leave it out there forever and ever. Uh, you know, you need to close it out uh, eventually. So the default setting is says five bars, right? So if your order does not get picked up within five bars, then Raven will just cancel the order and wait for the next trade setup and the next trade signal to occur. So um, let's see. So I'll shorten this down to two two bars. All right. So now here's where we have the offset price, right? So if I a negative value, so how about if I put negative um, five ticks, uh, right? So five cents on oil. So a negative value means you're going to get a better fill, right? So um, on this short signal here that we see on the chart, negative five ticks would put your limit order five ticks higher, right? Because five ticks higher is a better fill price when you're going short, uh, right? If you're going long, then it would put your limit order five ticks lower in a long, uh, long position to get a better fill. All right. Um, let's see. Okay, I'll leave back test mode on so that way we can actually uh, hopefully see some examples, um, you know, of a back test of getting filled with this uh, five tick offset. And let me just put in a, a simple um, profit and target. Uh, let's see, oil. Um, I'll put in a, a larger stop. Let's see, I'll put in 15 and 20 there. All right, I think that ought to set us up just just to show this example of, of using a, a five tick offset. And always remember, you got to turn your strategies on. So we have to. The last thing you have to do is set that to true and turn it on. All right. Put that on there. You'll notice. Uh, you'll notice that when you have back test mode turned on in the settings, that Raven, you can see the buttons here flickering, and that's because the buttons um, turn on and off based on the back testing that's going on. So that's telling you that the back that that the back testing is actually being processed. So, and um, let's see. All right, there we go. Good. Cool. So. <laughs> There's an example right there. So there was our trade signal. And um, so we got in at 52. And that 52 was offset from 47 because we used a five tick offset. So let's see if I have, if I can mark this here. There we go. All right, so that arrow is marking the closing price of the bar, which is at 47 cents. And since we uh, set a five tick offset, we can see our entry price was up here at 52 cents. All right, so that's five cent offset there. And then we got filled. And luckily, amazingly, our stop did not get hit up here. And we actually ended up with a profit. So, um, all right. Um, so, all right, good. Thank you, John. So, John was saying that's exactly what he's looking for. Um, and, yeah. Uh, all right, so, next follow-up question to Raven is from Philip. Um, all right, so, Philip's got two questions on his mind here. So, all right, so, question one. Uh, upon an indicator meeting certain parameters place a limit um, at the previous swing long price at the previous swing long price all right so currently raven is not or current low price okay um, yeah so currently raven is not capable of setting your um, limit price at based on an indicator um, 
Right. So Raven is just um, you know it's just a simple free strategy, um, so you can do you know some back testing. Uh, originally, Bloodhound didn't come with Raven. Um, you know we actually had people compile their own strategy and stuff, and you know we kind of realized that that was. Uh, um, um, what's what's the word? Um, kind of went against the, the the you know of what Bloodhound is all about. You know, Bloodhound is about not having the coding. Yet when Bloodhound version one came out, you know, we were asking people to compile a strategy code. So um, you know, so to make sure that um, you know where we're consistent consistent with our you know, with what we're trying to do, which is, you know, provide a strategy building solution without having the coding. So, you know, so to do that, we had to basically uh, compile the strategy code that we had on our website, compile it, and we just turned it into Raven and added a few extra features. Um, all right. Um, and let's see. All right. So question two. Um, and all right, so question two: uh, Can you possibly look uh, at how to enter on a 50% retracement of the last swing? All right, so Philip, I need to know what indicator you're using to calculate that 50% retracement, because uh, Blood Ninja Trader doesn't come with any indicator that provides that 50% price level. Um, you know, they have, uh, here, let me close this window. I, I know, you know, NinjaTrader has these draw tools, but these are just draw tools, right? Um, these don't provide uh, price information to an indicator. These are just visual helpers on your chart, but they don't, they don't interact with indicators. So you can't use these draw tools with Bloodhound or any other indicator um, so yeah so Philip I need to know um, kind of what um, what indicator you'd be using so and actually if I remember um, yeah you know I did give an example a few workshops back um, you know it was a very loose example <laughs> of how you could, yeah, look for um, a pullback in price, you know, to some kind of fib level. Uh, and I had to use the pivots indicator to kind of give this example because I don't have, uh, I don't have a fib indicator uh, uh, installed, and in, you know, there's no free fib indicator uh, available. So in these workshops, I only demonstrate freely available indicators so that so that um, you know I don't show I guess I should say I don't show proprietary indicators in this workshop because when I pass out these you know bloodhound templates to people they have to have those indicators installed on their system and if it's proprietary that means they won't be able to open up this this template so therefore I only use you know freely available indicators that people can go you know, to Big Mike or to Ninja Trader and, and download the indicator, so that way they can open up the templates. All right, so give me a moment and let me look through some of the previous workshop write-ups and see if I can figure out which workshop it was where I actually did demonstrate how you could look for a, a pullback to a kind of a, a fib zone, or basically any, you know, that example applied to any kind of support resistance zone. Okay, I found it. So it was on November 14th. It was the fifth example I gave in that workshop. And um, so it was uh, how to set up an alert sound when price breaks or crosses a certain level. So a certain level could be your 50% fib line, right? Or, you know, a, a pivot support resistance line, you know, whatever kind of level you want. So November 14th workshop. Um, let's see if we've had a chance to process that video. Um, all right. So on my web page here, I, uh, I have YouTube up. And I'm going to go to 
Let's see. I'm gonna. If you click on Jeremy's name here, it'll take you to our actual home page on YouTube. And under downloads, so this downloads section just shows all the uh, or uploads. This shows all the uploads in chronological order. So we can click on that. And um, oh, here it is. All right, detecting higher highs and lower lows. So this is that workshop and admittedly this was a very long workshop this is probably one of the longest ones I've ever done and let's see here if we open up the show more um, yeah here we go so Keith started this is a new little feature that we found in, uh, available using YouTube is Keith is able to specify a time a start time for each of these topics now, uh, you know, which I don't think was capable uh, was available um, in 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 the past. But see here, it says how to set up an alert sound when price breaks or crosses a certain level, and it has a time zone here. And YouTube turns this this timestamp into into a link, and it boom takes you right there, right to that point. So this is a cool new feature that we're able to add to the descriptions here um, that Keith had discovered. So you can see it took us right to that point in the in the workshop video. So, all right, all right. So Gunter's using a 60-minute uh, chart. All right, a 10 EMA 10 period. Let's see. It looks like he's looking for a big candle. So he would like. A I'd like to have a signal um, on a Renko chart when they cross over the Renko uh, crosses over the Renko chart. All right, so Gunter, if I understand you correctly, I think you're looking for price to cross over the EMA 10. Is that what you're looking for? Uh, okay, gotcha. All right. All right, let's minimize that. And all right, so we want um, all right, a Renko chart. Uh, and he mentions uh, a big candle. So I guess you're looking for, wait. Oh, okay. Actually, I think, let me rephrase your question, Gunter. So are you working on two different time frames? You're working on a, on a 60 minute chart and a Renko chart? Because you mentioned both, um, okay, gotcha. All right, so all right, so we're dealing with a multi-time frame uh, situation here. So let's um, let's see. This is oil. So how about we create a 10 Renko chart? <clears throat> and I need to connect to the data feed again, uh, so I can load up the data that we need, and. We're also going to be using a, let's see, where is the chart? Oh, there it is. Not that one. Here we go. All right. So we want a 60-minute chart. And I just have to wait for the data to load. All right. I'll change this to oil as well. Let's get an EMA on here. Um, oh, actually, yeah, let's see. So, Gunter, do you want the EMA on the 60-minute chart or the Renko chart? Okay. Yeah. So, you know, just just so you guys know, that's the reason why I ask for you providing a lot of detail is. So I don't have to go back and forth and ask all these questions, and the whole thing goes a lot quicker if you can provide as much detailed information as you can think of. Um, and this is kind of a, an example why. Um, I know it's sometimes you can't think of everything at first, but 
All right, so I just loaded a, uh, a chart template here that, um, let's see, which one of these is my EMA? Uh, there we go. Okay, let's remove the SMA and change this to an EMA 10. Okay, so there's a 60 minute um, with an EMA 10, and we're looking for uh, crossover conditions. But we want to see those crossovers on our lower time frame, you know, Renko chart here. So let's open up Bloodhound, and the first thing we'll need to do is add another, is add a 60-minute chart to our Bloodhound system. So we'll change this from one minute to 60 minutes. And before we go any further, I'm just going to close the Bloodhound, and because You'll see here it says we need to, you know, press press F5 on the chart, you know, so we have to do that in order to get Ninja Trader to build that 60-minute data inside of Bloodhound. All right, so now we have 60-minute data available inside of Bloodhound. All right, so we're looking for a crossover, and actually I should uh, so let me switch to a logic template first. All right, so I'll create a new logic template. And All right, so when we look at our list of solver nodes here, we can see now that we, it looks a little different, right? So we have our default time frame, so we can add solvers to the default time frame, new solvers, or we can add new solvers to our 60-minute time frame now. So let's add a crossover solver to the 60 minute time frame. There we go. Drop that on there. And um, so we're just looking for the closing price. So I'll change indicator A to the closing price. And we're looking to cross over the EMA 10. So let's change this to our EMA. And that essentially does it. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to add, uh, actually I'll just create a simple crossover on this chart, on our 60 minute chart. So I'm not going to get very detailed with this, just something real quick and simple so we can see the signals on both charts, on both the 60 minute and the Renko chart. So it's always good to have a visual aid, right? Uh, trading is all about visual aids, you know. So uh, sorry about that. Uh, I thought I'd turn my phone off. All right, so I built a simple crossover solver. Uh, the closing price crossing the EMA 10. So we can see that on our 60 minute chart now. And let's see, do I have, let's see, oh, there we go. Let's turn the global crosshairs on. And okay, so there we go. Um, now we can see the crossovers. Uh, it's pretty much uh, that simple. You'll notice, though, all right, on our Renko chart, there's there's multiple bars um, identifying the crossover, and that's because of the the timing, um, uh, you know, the the timing difference. So, um, what that's telling us is that there is quite a lot of these Renko bars that are existing inside of the 60-minute bar. So during the entire duration of the 60-minute bar, um, these Renko bars, or, or the Renko chart, is going to show us that crossover uh, for the entire duration of the 60-minute 
uh, bar. So that's kind of um, NinjaTrader's default behavior. Um, and uh, this, this is kind of another sub reason of why we're coming out with Bloodhound version 2 to kind of create some more granularity um, and, and some more detailed ways of how we can handle uh, this timing, you know, mismatch uh, and timing sequences between, you know, a higher time and a lower time and, you know, uh, and, and between like, you know, the 60 minute is well defined, you know, you get one bar every 60 minutes, but Ranko bars, they're, they're, a Ranko bar could last one second or a Ranko bar could last five minutes. So there's no fixed number of bars that are going to go by on a Ranko bar when you're comparing it to a 60 minute chart. Um, so Bloodhound version 2 will give us more flexibility um, and more cap uh, capabilities, you know, of, of displaying other time frames um, on our default chart. You know, so Bloodhound, theoretically, Bloodhound version 2 should give us the capability of just showing us just the first Ranko bar where the crossover occurred. And the other, you know, the other short signals would not show up, only the first bar. You know, that, that's kind of some of the more advanced features that we're hoping Bloodhound version 2 will give us. So, um, all right. Um, I think that addresses Gunter's question there. And um, so I guess just to show this again, all I had to do is create a 60-minute chart, put our crossover on it, and let me name this. This is uh, EMA 10. Actually, it's so it's the uh, close um, versus the EMA 10 crossover. So there we go. Okay. So there's our solver named now. Um, yeah, so there we go. And oh yeah, so look at, here's an interesting situation. If you look at the left edge of our 60 minute chart, you can see price crossed that EMA a whole bunch of times in a row, you know, like four times in a row. And we can see that on the Ranko bar. So we can see one of these Ranko bars we only got a long signal for one bar, and then it switched back over to a short crossover for four bars, you know, and then a single long crossover on one Ranko bar, and then we got three Ranko bars with a short signal. You know, that just kind of shows the, the timing mismatch. Um, you know, normally this, I guess, because the 60-minute chart is such a, a large chart that if you're dealing with a 10 Ranko, it's probably not an issue, but um, you'll see that sometimes signals from the, a higher time frame can actually get missed or not show up on the lower time frame. Um, and uh, that's kind of one of the, the issues we're hoping to solve with Bloodhound version 2. Um, so that's why it's important to visualize, visually see your conditions on your higher time frame when you're building a system, right? So if you're working with higher time frames, you know, build those conditions on those charts so you can see when those conditions happen and make sure that they're showing up on your default chart, you know, your trading chart. Because um, sometimes, you know, if these bars went by too fast, then sometimes a signal or a condition from a higher time frame sometimes do not show up on a lower time frame. Uh, so, uh, you know, like I said, that's one of the issues we're hoping to solve with Bloodhound version 2. So, okay, um, and yeah, Gunter is aware of that. So, yep. So, um, if that's what you're experiencing now, really there is no, um, there is no fix to get around that um, other than to take your your default chart right your the chart that you're trading on and I guess you could make it a, a higher time frame so to speak you know that that would help um, you know or take your higher time frame and make it slightly lower 
Um, so, yeah. At least that's really the only thing we can really do now, for now. So, Philip would like to see. Um, so if we use like the Don Chain uh, indicator, uh, which right, which tracks the low and high points of price, and so he'd like to kind of um, generate a signal when price approaches the dawn chain again and gets within one tick of the dawn chain so kind of like so it's kind of like a I guess you could say this is a, a a way a roundabout way of looking for double bottoms or double tops um, and so we'll we'll just so that'll be the the trade setup signal and then we'll just um, submit that as a market order um, Okay, all right, so actually instead of using the Don Chain, um, Philip would like to use the Swing High-Low Indicator. All right, so let's pop this on the chart. Um, all right, so I have, you know, I, I've, I've used a, uh, a set default property here to set up my swing high low indicator so it, it only shows me the widest bottoms and the widest tops so the widest plots those are basically the outermost swing points right so those are your 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 highest highs and your lowest lows as detected by the indicator these two tightest plots the tightest plots those are like the in, inner swing points right so you know, if you're looking at a uh, you know an A B C D pattern, um, you know A and D would be the widest. Um, well, actually, I should say uh, one two three. If you're looking at a one two three swing pattern, and then you have A B and C as internal swing points, you know minor swing points in between swings one two and three, um, the widest plots would be you know the bigger swing moves right so it'd be like swing one and two and the inner the internal or inner smaller swing points um that price can do would be the tightest plots so that's what what the difference is here so we just want to look at the wider swing points which would would which is what will help us identify double tops or double bottoms um and so i already have this indicators set up to just show me those and I have my tightest plots uh, turned off um, and let's see uh, number of swings I think let's see yeah I think three ought to be fine we'll leave the sensitivity at three I'll just lay yeah, I'll just leave default settings here and um, okay I'm just gonna Minimize the plot values of some of these other indicators. And let's see. Oh, look here. Okay. Looks like we found one already. Right here at the beginning, the end of the chart. So there we go. Looks like price pulled back to our low within a, a, a tick or two yeah all right so I think that'll I think that'll work for our situation here all right I'll need a new uh, new logic template and let's see so what to name this um, I guess I'll just call it double top and uh, double bottom. Um, yeah, we'll take double bottom hmm, example. All right, so now let's see. We need to determine, you know, which solver would work uh, best for this situation. And essentially, we're we're doing a, a comparison. We're comparing you know price to 
an, an indicator plot. And we're going to look for this comparison um, to be a, a certain number of ticks away. Right, so we're comparing when, in this case, when I guess the low price gets within a certain number of ticks of our swing low plot. And then the opposite will be true is we'll be looking for when um, price uh, gets within our swing high uh, to possibly, you know, detect a double top. So, all right, so we'll, um, we're working on our default time frame. So let's grab a comparison solver. Connect that up. All right, so we're looking for um, the high and low and comparing it to the swing high low indicator. All right, so indicator A will plug our high and low prices into that. Right. Grab chameleon to give us the high and low prices. All right. So if the low, uh, if the low comes back down to our widest bottom plot, right, we're going to be looking for a long, um, for a double bottom for a long signal, and the high. So the high price will be used to generate short signals when the high comes up and approaches our double top, uh, the blue plot line. All right, next thing, we'll set up the, the swing high-low indicator into the indicator B section. All right, I left all these settings um, as default. So next, we need to select which plots we actually want to use. So remember, we're using the, the pink line, which is our double bottom line, um, to generate long signals. So when the low price approaches our widest bottom plot, we're looking for a bounce off of that. And so we want to get a long signal. And if the high price of the bar uh, approaches our blue, our blue line, which is our widest tops, we're looking for a bounce and generate a short signal there. Like so. Um, all right. Next thing um, is that's actually okay. Yeah. So the next thing we need to do is we're actually going to clear out all of our outputs here because we're going to oh, put a zero in there. We're going to use this neutral zone here and. So we're going to put um, one tick in both in, in a large amount and small amount. We're going to set a one tick um, offset. And then we're going to use this neutral zone here. And that's what we're looking for. And let's see. Oh, maybe price is not within one tick. Let's check that out. Oh, it's two ticks away. <laughs> All right, let's set this to two. So we'll look for a two tick. There we go. And um, yep. So that now one thing about this neutral zone is it actually creates a zone that is two ticks above and two ticks below. And sometimes my uh, this description doesn't update. You'll see it says by zero ticks, right? It says A greater than B by zero ticks. So if this happens to you, um, you can just click off the solver and click back on the solver. And that forces the display to update. So now you can see it says A greater than B by two ticks and A less than B by two ticks. 
So this actually creates a two tick zone above and below uh, the plot line. So this would actually allow um, a, a two tick, it would, it would allow the low price to actually go two ticks below um, the plot line and still qualify uh, for an output, right? Still qualify for a signal there. And so the next thing we'll do the same for the short, set that, turn that neutral zone on for the short side. And let's see, yep, yeah, there we go. So, um, so we can see now whenever the high price is, um, you know, within two ticks of that plot line there. So, uh, you know, you uh, clearly this is not a double top or double bottom. So you need to create some other conditions, you know, that would, I guess, invalidate this area here. You know, you need to create some other conditions that would, I guess, invalidate this um, since price you know, broke above the plot line, you'd have to set up some other um, solvers and conditions, you know, if you wanted to invalidate that situation. But uh, right there, that, that ended up perfect. So that worked. Um, let's take a look at some others. Yeah, there we go. So, you know, this first uh, long signal that looked good then of course price broke below it um, so you know what you could do is maybe you can find an indicator that kind of does the same thing as this swings highs lows but um, whenever price breaks it uh, right it turns off which actually uh, ninja traders swing indicator does that Let's put that on there. There we go. There's the swing indicator. And all right, we'll leave a strength of five. And all right, that looks good for plots. All right, so let's take a look at that. There we go. All right, so I put the swing indicator. Uh, I changed the Z order so it's on top, and we can see, um, yeah, the swing indicator stops whenever price comes down and actually breaks breaks that value. So maybe the swing indicator, you know, might work a little better for you instead of the swing high low. Um, so you can just substitute that indicator out if that does work better for you. Um, yeah. Oh, well, actually, I guess uh, there was one thing to keep in mind, because um, let me expand this chart out a little bit. So, situation that we will encounter if we use the swing indicator, NinjaTrader swing indicator. So we can see that price um, price broke it and the plot turned, turned off, it disappeared. Um, you know, so what... You know what happens if we do still want a signal here, um, but the plot disappeared. You know, so how do we how do we handle that? And um, what we can do is I'll show you how to handle that situation. Um, so let's I want to make a copy of that solver I just made, and I can just modify it a little bit. So I'll make a copy. So this is actually just going to be the swing indicator, whereas this one is actually using the SI swing. So I'll clarify the name of the solver there. So it's SI swing, and this one's going to be Ninja Trader swing indicator. So let me go put that on the logic board here. So let's go to our existing nodes, our default time frame, and there's that new solver I made a copy of. Let's plug that in.
All right, so I need to swap out the SI swings high low with Ninja Trader swing indicator. And there it is. All right, we're using uh, strength of five. And all right, so here's the plots. Let's see. We're using the low, the swing low to generate a long signal, the swing high to generate a short signal. And all right, so look. Um, so you can see that look, price came down, but the plot line disappeared, and there's no signal. So let me scroll forward and see if we actually see any signals. Okay, yeah, so there, this situation, it still worked out because price didn't actually break that swing line and turn the plot off. But um, back here, it did. So let's, uh, let me find that point again. Where? There we go. Here's the situation right here. Right there. So what we can do is we can use this displacement function. And so this is NinjaTrader's displacement function. And what that will do is it'll take the indicator plot and it shifts it forward one bar. So we can see the plot turns off on this bar, but we can shift it forward one bar um, so that we can actually do the comparison of the low price to the indicator by shifting that plot forward by one. So if we set our displacement to one, and there we go, now the signal shows up. So we don't, right, we don't see this displacement shift on the chart, but we're, we're doing it inside of Bloodhound. So if I did actually do it on the chart, actually, I guess I could do show it on the chart. Um, there we go. This is our displacement. Set it to one. And there. So now you can see the little orange dot is now... Um, on the, the bar that actually, you know, touched that swing low. So that's what the displacement does. So. And I'm going to go set this back to zero. TJ has a question here going back to uh, the earlier discussion of back testing on the Ranko and the line break bar. So any kind of bar type that doesn't show the true opening price, um, right? So even, even you know, our pro rank go doesn't show the true opening price. Um, and you know, there's a lot of other companies. You know, Pure Logic makes something similar to the pro rank go. Um, RJ makes something similar to these, you know, these, I guess what I call hybrid Ranko bars or median Ranko bars. It's kind of the generic term I've heard floating around a lot. Um, all right, so just to give an, a visual demonstration, right? So, uh, you know, clearly that is not the opening price of the bar. Um, you know, we can actually see these bars building in real time. And we can see, you know, the bar really is not, the price is not up here when that bar opened, right? So Ranko bars, by design have a modified open price and so TJ was asking um, asking about that back testing so he's saying any any bar without a true open would have low high and close different as well no that's not true that's actually not well not totally true um, it depends on the direction of the bar Right, so obviously the high price of these down bars is incorrect, right? Because the high price and the open are the same. And since the low price was modified to be higher than where price truly is, we can see in this case, this high is incorrect. Um, however, on this bar, look, on this bar, it actually generated a wick. So we know that the high price of this bar with a wick is correct. But we still, but we also know that the opening price is incorrect. Um, you know, so there's um, a lot of, um, you know, variances as to what prices are correct and which ones are not. Um, so uh, that's that's kind of the reason why I 
came up with the uh, the back test Ranko. Uh, so actually, in the back test Ranko, let's see. If we have wave mode, uh, wave mode. If it's off, then the brick size does nothing. The only thing that matters is um, the uh, trending bar, the new trending bar, and the reversal size. So if I wanted this to look like a um, a five brick Renko, I could set the new trending bar to five, and the reversal is ten, and that would make it look like that would make it act like a five brick Renko. And let's take a look at this. And how about if I change this to a five Renko? And yeah, so there, if you can see my crosshairs are actually turned on, right? So you can see that the closing price, uh, actually, let me expand these bars out a little bit so it's a little easier to see. And um, all right, hopefully that's a little easier to see. So, all right, so look at my crosshairs, right? You can see they line up. Now look at the next bar. You see, the chart on the right, it's showing the true opening price, which is way, which is actually a tick higher than the previous bar, right? So if we look at the chart on the left, the Ranko chart, right, we can see the Ranko chart clearly has an opening price um, much lower at 16 cents. But on my back test Ranko, we can see that the real opening price was actually up at um, 22 cents. And we can see that there's actually a wick on that bar. There's a wick on that bar that actually went up another penny. So the high of this bar um, is actually higher than the open, right? So the back test Ranko would allow you to back test, um, you know, a system built to use Ranko bars. Um, and it's going to give you the correct highs and lows and open. Um, but what it, so essentially what the back test rank is doing is it's it it's closing at the correct closing prices, right? But the open high and low are correct or or true. Uh, whereas the Ranko bars don't show you any wicks, they don't show you any highs and lows, and the opening price is always modified so um, all right so TJ I hope that kind of helps a little bit all right so I guess we're done for the day guys